Good evening. Well, it's great to be here this evening. Packed house, standing room only. I think there's a few seats down in the front, but maybe I can't tell if there are any left up there in the balcony or not. Bring you greetings from our president, Dr. Janet Dudley Eschbach. I'm Don Cathcart, provost at Salisbury State University. Are there, edu are there educators in the house? Let's see your hands. Maybe, let me ask that again. Now let's think about it just for a moment. Think about it for a moment. Is there anybody here who is not an educator? I think even you're wrong. <laughs> I think we're all educators. That's something that we have in common with, with all other people. Tonight's lecture is part of the E. Pauline Ryle lecture series, but is also coincidental with the celebration of Salisbury State's 75th anniversary. We think in terms of numbers like 75 and 100. Uh, and a personal note, I'm, I'm, I realized walking over here today I was doing a little arithmetic and I, I'm in my 40th year in education and it can't be that uh, half of Salisbury State University's life I've been engaged in the art of teaching. But it's a reflective moment for me and I know that tonight we're all going to have additional reflective moments. I had the opportunity to, took the opportunity today to reread a, a couple of Alfie Cohen's articles that have appeared in the last few months, and I know that this is going to be a very stimulating and dynamic evening. Parker Palmer, in The Heart of the Teacher, wrote, if students and subjects accounted for all the complexities of teaching, our standard ways of coping would do. Keep up with our fields and learn techniques to stay ahead of the student psyche. But there's another reason for these complexities. We teach who we are. And in the 40 years that I've been in education, from middle school and high school and at university level, I've been fortunate in being allowed to teach who I am. I think that's probably how I've survived in large measure from how I've survived for 40 years. And I was thinking about this as I was reading, if I can paraphrase a little bit from Alfie Cohen, how, how do we teach who we are if we're threatened by top-down, heavy-handed, corporate style, standardized version of school reform that is driven by testing. Could I do it again if I were starting now, arrive where I am with still energy and passion for teaching after 40 years? That's, I don't know if I could. Another of the individuals who have guided by thinking about teaching over a period of time has been uh, a, a Swami Vivekananda who wrote and educated people back around in the 1890s. He wrote, like fire in a piece of flint, knowledge exists in the mind. Suggestion is the friction which brings it out. Now we know something about who we are and what we're trying to accomplish. And tonight we're going to get some additional knowledge that will cause us to ponder. And I'm sure that uh, our speaker tonight will create plenty of friction to bring that knowledge to the fore. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Beth Barnett, the Dean of the Samuel W. and Marilyn C. Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies, who will put this lecture in the context of the Pauline Ryle Lecture Series. Good evening and thank you very much. Uh, my job is very simple and that is to bring greetings from the Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies. It's rather awesome to stand up here though and to look out at this crowded, crowded auditorium. 
this auditorium, I am sure, really meets the vision that E. Pauline Rao had when she established an endowment that would allow us to present the type of lectures that we are going to hear tonight. This lecture has the tradition, of course, of being always free and open to the public, but more importantly, it allows us in the School of Education and Professional Studies to interact with, to talk with those of you who are either thinking about becoming teachers, who are teachers, who may have been teachers, or who don't really know yet that you are teachers, as we all are. The vision that we're seeing realized tonight, though, would not have been possible without some other people, and I have the opportunity to recognize those. First is Dr. Bosman, former chair of the education department here at Salisbury State University. Dr. Bosman is over here to my left. It was through his vision and his friendship with Ms. Ryle that allowed the endowment to be formed and that allowed the program, the idea of bringing together educators on the Eastern Shore of Maryland to hear some of what is the cutting edge of education. His vision allowed this to happen. I also would be remiss if I did not thank Sam and Lynn Seidel, who are not with us this evening, but for their generosity. The money that they have also endowed into the Seidel School allows us to bring some of the best minds here who would like to become teachers. And that, of course, brings me back to the vision. I look out in the audience and I see many of you who I see in the halls of Carruthers, and I want to say I'm so happy to see you here, but more importantly, I'm so happy to see that you are going to learn how to be a teacher from the faculty at Salisbury State University. And of course, that is my final thanks to the faculty here for making this possible for all of us tonight. Please enjoy the lecture and thank you. It is indeed a pleasure to see so many folks out tonight, uh, especially after having such a beautiful spring day that you would still take the time to come tonight. Um, I would also like to extend my thanks to some people that make this uh, lecture work and work well. Three people at the university play an important part in such an endeavor. One is Donna Test in uh, conference planning. The other is Tony Broadbent, who you've seen tonight, who takes care of our technical uh, work. And Cindy Cornish, who is in, responsible for the TV broadcasts and the recordings. I thank them very much, along with the Ryle Committee. Those people are listed in your program. In addition to myself, we have uh, Nomsa Galetta, Joel Jenny, and Pat Richards, three professors in education who work to be sure that this lecture uh, takes place. And I would like you all to join me in thanking all of them. I'd also like you to, to invite you to stay around after the uh, presentation is over. We do have a book signing and a reception in the social room, which is the room next door to the auditorium. Tonight's um, uh, presentation, lecture, this series tonight is dedicated to a former member of the education department. Dr. Charles Long was a professor here from 1980 to 1999, 20 years of incredible service to the community. Community. Many of you know him, a man of, with a big heart. You know him as the man who uh, was an auto heart player. He um, was a bookworm. He loved a garden. He loved a good cigar. But probably the thing that you remember most about him was his passion and his zeal for teaching and, and how he affected so many teachers and children in this area in a, in a positive way. Um, the reason tonight is dedicated to Charlie is because Charlie was so influenced by the work of Alfie Cohn. Uh, there are many reasons for this influence. Uh, perhaps the greatest of these reasons is because Cohn is such an advocate um, and, and, and an outspoken advocate for what's good for children. He questions those things that we often take for granted. He causes us to examine those everyday things we do and evaluate the cumulative effect of such practices. He helps us recognize some of the myths and misconceptions that drive what we do. He's best known perhaps in educational uh, circles for his criticisms of competition, rewards and punishment, and standardized testing. He's the author of many books and articles. 
Uh, he uh, writes on human behavior, education, and social theory. Educated at Brown University and the University of Chicago, Alfie Cohn's a researcher, a teacher, a journalist, and has some other interesting things he may talk about in his past. Uh, I'm sure tonight that you're going to hear a very provocative as well as inspiring speaker. Please join me in welcoming Alfie Cohn. I refuse to take the stairs. <laughs> when they give you lined paper, wrote Garcia Lorca, write the other way. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, people have been uh, repeatedly during this introductory process uh, thanking you so much for coming. And I just want to make absolutely sure that everyone is, in fact, here by choice. That was a little too much laughter for comfort. <laughs> so, in the unlikely event that you are a student here at Salisbury State and were required by your instructor to show up, you have my permission to write an impassioned note to your instructor indicating how disrespectful and inappropriate it is to make people show up where they will then learn. In fact, it would be an amazing assignment to talk about the inconsistency. And I have been in the position sometimes of talking to teachers, as well as students, about the importance of giving kids choices. And I'm speaking to a group of people incarcerated in an auditorium. <laughs> if you are required not only to show up, but to write a paper about what happened, <laughs> it is no longer humorous. <laughs> but becomes a profound reflection on the lack of reflection on the part of an instructor who would do that. And you have my permission to say that in your paper. <laughs> of course, I'm not being graded. <laughs> I have found, as a teacher and as a student, and as someone who likes to think about how learning happens and how it doesn't happen, I have become convinced that we are not empty receptacles into which knowledge is poured. That's why I don't like auditoriums too much. They're more about listening than about learning. So one of the ways I try to combat that is to mention a study, a piece of research, and then invite you to try to actively make some sense about why the results came out the way they did. I speak on a lot of different topics, and I try to find at least one provocative study for each one. Here's the one for tonight that I'm going to ask you to unpack with me. This study was done with fourth grade teachers in Colorado. The researchers gave all the teachers a piece of curriculum, a unit to teach, and said, you're going to teach this to your students. And then they divided the teachers into two groups. Group one of the teachers we're given the following instruction. You are going to be held accountable for how well you teach this to your students. You are responsible for raising standards in your classroom as will be judged by a test the students will take when you're finished teaching. Group two of the students, uh, sorry, of the teachers were given this instruction. See if you can facilitate your students' understanding of this material. All the teachers were then set loose to teach, and after that, all the kids were tested. Even though it was a fairly conventional test of a fairly conventional task, here's what happened. It turned out that the students who were taught by the group one teachers, the standards and accountability group, did much more poorly on the test. Bottom line result was that when there was an emphasis on standards and accountability, the achievement level was lower. Now the fact that the research came out that way will surprise some people and be perfectly predictable to others. The fact that it came out that way is worth knowing. In fact, it may even be worth going to the library here, looking up the study, photocopying it, 
and sending it to the governor, the state superintendent of education, the state board, the local newspaper, and even local school boards so they realize that this is what happened. I'll give you the citation in a bit, and in case I forget, it's on my website, as is a bunch of other subversive stuff, and that website is www.alfiecone.org. It's not supposed to be clever, it's just my name. <laughs> but at least as interesting and important as the fact that the research showed that accountability and standards tend to lower the quality of learning are the possible reasons why that is true. And there, there are no right answers here, but I'd like you to speculate. Take a minute and a half. Turn to somebody sitting near you, maybe in front of you or behind you, uh, if you are too well acquainted with the person sitting next to you. Meet somebody, say hello, and then take a minute or two together in this inappropriate space to turn it into a place of active learning by coming up with at least one hypothesis. Why do you think it might be true that the study came out the way it did. Say hello. Let me call you back. I'd love to get a sample, just a few. What did you just say or hear? What did you and your instant partner decide just might account for those counterintuitive results? Somebody want to um, suggest something? Remembering that there are no right answers? Yes, please. It wasn't about the student, it was about the test result. And somehow, in group one, presumably you mean, when the instruction was focused on the result, as opposed to the student, that led paradoxically to lower results. Thanks. So we have to figure out why that might have happened. Yeah. Yeah. Tense, scare, those are the, the operative words. Too much stress or anxiety 
If the teachers feel that, that's going to affect their instruction, and the kids will feel that way, too. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Well, I do, but I want to check them out. As, <laughs> so far, so good. OK. And then that affected their performance. Absolutely. I want to make sure I'm not missing anybody who might be up here in the cheap seats, who might be raising a hand that I can't see because of the lights. Yes, please. They're not understanding it because we have to cover a whole bunch of stuff. Howard Gardner says, coverage is the enemy of understanding. So when someone pressures you as a teacher to cover a bunch of stuff, they may not even understand that stuff, let alone care about it. Somebody else? Another? Yes. The teacher can't be as creative, and as a result, the kids don't learn as well. What's really interesting, I think, about this particular study is that this task was not even particularly creative. If it was, if real problem solving had to be done, and they got a chance to really display the extent of their creativity, you can only imagine how much wider the gulf would have been in the results, and how much better group two students would have done, but even on a conventional task, preparing the kids and covering them led to poorer results. Anybody else? One more? Or is that said at all? Yes, please. There was a companion study that quasi-replicated it as well as a bunch of other research that spoke to the same general principles of what happens when teachers feel controlled and what happens in accountability settings. Plus, there have been wider studies showing that the states in the United States that have high stakes testing, which is sort of writ large what was going on with these individual teachers, tends not to lead to better results by meaningful measures and sometimes undermines the results. But let me tell you about the companion study that was done in upstate New York. The teachers were divided into the same basic conditions, but instead of measuring student performance, they watched to see how the teachers actually taught. And what they found is that the teachers who were in the accountability condition basically turned into drill sergeants and removed almost any possibility for the students to play an active role in their own learning, which a whole bunch of research demonstrates is critical to success and meaningful learning. You might say, and in fact, a couple of explanations I just heard from people here suggest, when the teachers were controlled or felt that way, they responded by becoming controlling. And when that happens, the quality of learning goes down. When you put the two, those two studies together, you have a pretty clear indication of what might be causing the problem, as well as an indication of how serious the problem might be. Now, these days, people talk constantly about raising standards in schools. But what do they mean by standards? Are they broadly conceived about kids understanding ideas and being able to think coherently? Or are they very specific facts and skills they have to memorize and reproduce? Are the standards offered as guidelines to help teachers get better at their craft? Or are they mandates? This is what we mean by good teaching, and you do it or else. Is it something that helps kids think more deeply and with more excitement? Or is it simply something that has to do with trying to make things more difficult so we get tough with those damn kids and teachers? These are interesting questions, and our answer to that may help us decide how we feel about standards. In some cases, we might find that a useful thing. In other cases, not so much. Although, frankly, if you know where the word standard came from, it doesn't exactly lend confidence or excite confidence in the enterprise. You know where the word standard came from? Originally, the standard was the place on the battlefield where a king would stand and issue orders to his army. 
Some people would say the movement we're facing today is chillingly reminiscent of that, although the kings have different titles and are in different state capitals now. There was, a, uh, there was an education writer, some of you may know, named John Holt. He wrote, one ironical consequence of the drive for so-called higher standards in schools is that the children are too busy to think. He wrote that in 1959. I can only imagine his response to what is going on in Maryland and across the country now. Because that problem in this state and other states, some people believe, very nicely is captured by that apparent paradox. So what's wrong with tougher standards? I want to make an argument depends on how much time I leave myself, whether I talk about four problems or five problems. But I want to try to indicate why I think this movement that looks good, after all, you're not, a, you're not for tougher standards? What do you want, lower standards? Hmm, tough choice. The people have set it up in a very canny way, so it's hard to be against this. And if you know nothing about teaching or learning, if, for example, you've been elected to the state legislature, theoretically, <laughs> Then, even if you are well-meaning, and you're a good person, and you're a smart person, you may nevertheless be brought along in the wake of people who, for various other reasons, some not so savory, have turned our schools into giant test prep centers. And you may never have thought about it as a bad thing, because after all, don't we need tougher standards? So what's wrong with it? I want to give you a few reasons. And I want to uh, then talk about what some people are doing to resist. And then I want to take your questions and arguments and responses. Here's my first concern. Now, I want to, as much as possible, raise some issues that aren't just about Ms. Pap and its brothers and sisters in different states, but that may be relevant to what goes on in an individual classroom, elementary school, high school, or university. So let me start off with one that's really radical. I think the whole tougher standards movement, and a lot of other folks too, misunderstand motivation. There is an emphasis on achievement, performance, results that sounds at first like, of course, everyone's for those things. But the more you think about it and the more you know the research, the more problematic it becomes. This is before we get to the level of looking at a particular standardized test. There's a whole bunch of research that's been published in education journals with a circulation typically of about 37, so nobody ever reads this <laughs> stuff outside the field. But it turns out to be vitally important for students, teachers, and future teachers. And here's what the research basically says. I'm going to boil it down. There's a big difference between getting students focused on how well they're doing and getting them focused on what they're doing. There's a big difference between emphasizing performance and achievement, and on the other hand, focusing on the task itself and the learning. Now, I don't know if that seems surprising to you or such obvious common sense that there's no point in mentioning it. But in my experience, there is a point in mentioning it because a lot of people mush that stuff together. They think, well, aren't those two aspects of the same thing? We want higher performance at learning tasks. But in fact, it's very different. Imagine a kid who comes to school whose goal that day is to figure out why the character in this novel we read leaves home at the end even though she didn't seem to be unhappy. Or a student whose goal that day is to come up with a new way of getting to the correct answer on the math problem that's not the same as what she was told in class. Those are learning goals. Now contrast that with a student who comes to school whose goal is to get an A, or a student who wants to impress the teacher with a brilliant comment or response in class. 
That's not a learning goal. That's a goal about me. It's a goal about performance. It's not a goal about the learning, per se. Or imagine a parent who hears that his or her child has written an essay, whether that child is 10 years old or 20 years old. What is the question that a parent might ask? Some parents might ask questions such as, how did you decide what topic you wanted to write about? Assuming you're lucky enough to have a teacher who lets you pick. Or, did you already know what conclusion you would come to at the end before you started? Or did your mind change through the process of writing? Those parental questions are about learning, about what the student is doing. And then, sadly, there are parents whose question is, how did you do on it? What grade did you get? Did your, did your teacher like it? Are you improving in essay writing compared to two months ago? Those are anti-intellectual questions. Teachers, too, and heaven knows, state departments of education can be so focused on achievement, performance, results, that they end up undermining the guts of the learning experience. And several bad things, to use the technical term, can happen as a result. What can happen when you overemphasize achievement and performance in a classroom, whether it's first grade or university? One thing that can happen, and according to the research typically does happen, is that students become less interested in the learning itself when they're constantly focused on how well they're doing. After a while, it's not about making sense of stuff and playing with ideas. It's about showing that I'm better at doing this stuff. And pretty soon, it becomes a chore. And the next thing you know, students are saying, do we have to know this? Is this going to be on the test? <laughs> and at that point, folks, you might as well just say, this is a charade at the university level. Here's my $1,000, just give me the diploma. It's a credentialing exchange process. Let's give up the pretense that it's about ideas. And when students ask this, do we have to know this? Is it going to be on the test? I typically don't blame the students. I blame a system that has convinced them over the years that it's all about how well you're doing. But for teachers and prospective teachers who want kids to become lifelong learners, not just as a buzz phrase. Some of you may know this, but I swear you could break into the bedroom of an elementary school teacher at 3 in the morning, shake her awake. Quick, what's your long-term goal for the students you teach? A lifelong learner. And how did you get in my bedroom? <laughs> in that order. For people who on reflection say, my goal for my own kids or my students is not just to have them know a bunch of stuff that they could look up anyway. My goal is for, is for them to really get off on playing with words or numbers or ideas. And I want them to want to do that even when the last bell has rung. So it is disturbing, to say the least, for people who think that way, to see what the research says. And the research says, if you have a classroom or school that uses traditional grades, A, B, C, D, F, or 0 to 100, which is even worse, if you have an environment that is big on raising test scores, regardless of the design of the test, if you have a place, in short, that is constantly about results, students become less excited about figuring stuff out. That's a huge price to pay, and many people don't even realize we're paying it. What else happens when you overemphasize achievement and results? You get kids who seem like they're fine as long as they're succeeding, and then they hit a bump in the road, and now they are overwhelmed. They come to feel helpless. They think it's out of their control, and the world has ended. 
Now, what's interesting about this is not doing well is a relative concept. Have any of you ever met the student who always gets 100 and one day gets a 92 and life is over? <laughs> Some of you teachers have those students. Some of you are or were those students. But I think we respond to a student like that in the wrong way. A lot of teachers will respond by saying exactly the wrong thing and try to be sympathetic. For example, honey, a 92 is still a very good score. You should be proud of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm sure you can get your usual 100 again next time. <laughs> Those responses underscore what made this problem occur in the first place by saying, you had the right idea. This class is not about exploring ideas. It's about how well you do. You were just a little too hard on yourself. You drew the line a little too high between OK and not OK. 92 is actually OK. Now, if you got a 45 on the test, yeah, beat yourself up. <laughs> but 92, not so much. But it does, where you draw the line isn't the key issue for people who have some perspective on the larger question. The key issue is the overemphasis on how well you do. Because we all can't succeed all the time, and it's going to trip us up when we don't by whoever's standards. Here's another thing that happens. When you overemphasize results, you get people who pick the easiest possible task when they're given a choice. How, can any of you relate to being allowed to pick and you pick the shortest book? Or the project that is suspiciously familiar to one you did in another class? <laughs> now, teachers, in responding to this, again, often get it wrong. They misanalyze the problem here, and they will blame the student for being lazy. And here is what a student, an unusually articulate six-year-old, could respond if he or she was brave enough, as well as having the right words. When the teacher says, you know that was the shortest book with the biggest type, why don't you challenge yourself some more? Why don't you, why do you cut corners? Don't be so lazy. Here's what the kid would say. Here's what the college student might say. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not being lazy. I'm being rational. When you told me this is a, I, I, know, I know you can get an A in here. Or when you, mom or dad, said, I want to see a higher GPA. I want to see you with a better report card. I want to see, I know you can do better. What you were really saying to me was, by the way, this is not about learning. The point here is not to take risks and try to figure out new stuff. The point is to succeed. And so, duh, the shorter the book, the better the chance I'm going to give you what you want, which is success, not ideas, not exploration. When you said to me, I want to see better results, you were saying, of course you should pick the easiest thing, because if you take a chance on something you might not be good at, you might not do well. And it's about doing well. It's not about exploring the world. It's not about making connections and distinctions and trying out fields and books that are scary but exhilarating, that make me curious. So. When we have a system that overemphasizes success and achievement and results, whether it's kindergarten or graduate school, students will respond by minimizing challenge. And then some of the same people who turn around and say, these kids today, which they've been saying since the words existed, these kids today, always taking the easy path, then put more emphasis on GPAs and test scores, thereby creating even more of this phenomenon. Here's one more thing that tends to happen when you overemphasize results. Kids and students of all ages tend to think in a more superficial manner. The research suggests that by meaningful measures, the quality of thinking and problem solving is lower where grades are emphasized. The A students, too, are trying to psych out the test, figure out what the teacher wants to hear or the scorers of a standardized test want to read 
and then give them that instead of taking chances and creating new possibilities. So not only do you have people who are less interested in learning and who are thrown when they don't do so well in a way that can be permanent and can start when they're little kids learning, I'm not so smart. Not only do you have students who pick easiest, easy tasks when given a choice, but the quality of learning declines. Study after study finds these things are true with grades, for example. Every study that I have been able to find on the subject of grades finds that when you compare students in a traditional class where they're given a grade versus a class where there are no grades, it's the kids in the traditional class who don't like what they're doing as much, are less likely to do it on their own time, pick easier tasks, and don't learn as deeply. But it's not just grades. It's any kind of emphasis on results. Now, I'm going to say some uncomplimentary things in a moment about standardized tests. But I thought I would come at it at the beginning by looking at even relatively good measures or assessments. At the University of Michigan, Martin Mayer and Carol Midgley wrote a remarkable sentence. They're educational psychologists. Quote, an overemphasis on assessment can actually undermine the pursuit of excellence. Even good assessments, where you get to write or have to write, even good assessments, if there's too much focus on a standardized state level or an individual classroom level on how good you are, you end up with a problem in terms of real learning and desire to learn. One of the things you do is you kill the goose that laid the golden egg, which is interest. You want to raise standards and have excellence? So do I. But you can't reach into kids and make them have higher standards, and you can't do that with teachers either. If you want to know what the magic word is for real excellence in schools, it's interest. And so any state policymaker or local school board member who is concerned with excellence ought to be asking the primary question, how can we create schools that tap and nourish and sustain kids' desire to find out about themselves and the world? Because where interest comes, excellence tends to follow. But if you try to skip the interest part and reach directly to the raising standards part, you end up with people who see it as an unpleasant, tedious prerequisite to some result like a grade or a test score. There are plenty of individual classroom instructors and parents and students who have never been invited to think about these issues. And so naturally would say, raise standards? You know, we want achievement results? Of course, who doesn't? And meanwhile, you've got these research studies demonstrating that when you overemphasize how well students are doing, you end up eclipsing, even undermining, their engagement with what they're doing. And of course, that is nowhere more true than with the people Susan Ohanian calls the standardistos. <laughs> so that's my first concern with the movement, is it's utterly oblivious to that distinction and ignorant of the data suggesting that you can overemphasize achievement. Here's my second concern. I think these folks Typically, especially the standard Eastos, but again, it can happen in the local classroom as well, misunderstand what it means to improve. A lot of folks are running around with powerful positions, some of them now even living in the White House, <laughs> thanks to the Supreme Court, <laughs> who think if it's harder it must be better. Now, again, a bright six-year-old can tell you that's not always true. You know, if something is really too easy, there doesn't seem a point to doing it, and it's not that much fun. But if it's really too hard and beyond me, then I just feel dumb. 
A little kid knows that optimal difficulty is not the same thing as maximum difficulty. But I'm going to make a point that goes beyond that. I think we pay entirely too much attention to the whole criterion of difficulty. And that's going on all around us now. You know the policymakers and pundits who feel this way. You can recognize them by their key phrases. We're dumbing down the schools. We need to raise the bar. This last expression really gets me. It's probably the silliest expression in American education. Raise the bar. Never mind that this expression, I'm pretty sure, originated in the world of show horses. <laughs> which may tell us everything we need to know about the view of children on the part of people who talk that way. But there is truly this simplistic notion that if it's harder, it must be better. Sometimes they even take reasonable words and appropriate those words for this narrow purpose. Words you could like, except for the way they're used, like challenging. We want a challenging curriculum or a rigorous school. And when they use the word rigorous, contextually, what they often mean is onerous, as if that was the same thing. Let me give you an example, because I wish you could accuse me of exaggerating here. I wish you could accuse me of creating rhetorically a straw man because, in fact, people are much more sophisticated than this. Let me quote you first from a guy you may have heard of in history class, name of Clinton. He was president at one point. <laughs> in 1996, he spoke before the National Education Summit, which was held in New York. How many of you attended the National Education Summit? Oh, that's right, they didn't allow educators in. I forgot for a moment. That's quite true. The National Education Summit was uh, attended only by politicians and corporate executives who charted the course for the rest of us. But that's okay, because I understand they're going to have a big National Workplace Summit soon and invite only elementary school teachers, so it'll all work out. <laughs> but here's what Clinton said, quote, the most important thing, no, I won't try that. I won't. <laughs> At least not till I get my, my bush down, have it long. The most important thing you can do is to have high expectations for students to tell them they're going to have to learn really difficult, challenging things and to hold them accountable as well as reward them. Interchangeable from the current resident of the White House, as they are on most educational issues with the exception of vouchers and privatization. These days, knowing whether someone is considered a liberal or a conservative, a Democrat or a Republican, doesn't tell you much. The relevant distinction is between those who understand something about teaching and learning and those who, who haven't a clue. And by the way, despite my crack before, I don't expect state legislators and other politicians to understand the nuances of how kids best learn to read or how best to evaluate the success of schools. I don't expect them to know this stuff. I just expect them not to impose their ignorance on us with the force of law, which is apparently too much to expect these days. But there are other people who take the same view. I'm going to get this quote. I'm going to read it so you don't think I'm making it up. This is from the commissioner of a state, the education commissioner for an entire state out west. Could be any state. Don't have to embarrass him by naming. It could be any state that starts with C-O-L. But here's what he said. <laughs> He said, quote, unless you get bad results, it is highly doubtful you have done anything useful with your tests. Low scores have become synonymous with good tests, unquote. This is the kind of comment that threatens to make satire obsolete, you know? <laughs> but he was just stupid enough or candid enough to be explicit about exactly the mindset that is driving the whole tougher standards and accountability movement. One more example. I got a lot. but This one comes from an advertisement. Periodically, when newspapers like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today can't sell ads for all their pages, they will give pages for free to the ad council so they can run as a public service what amounts to corporate propaganda. And in this case, uh, it comes from a group called the Education Excellence Partnership, which is very large corporations for the most part. Um, and uh, here's an ad that has run over and over and over again. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but it's a, 
It's a little girl holding some books, and in huge letters at the top, it says, challenge me. And their diagnosis of what's wrong with American schools, I will spare you reading the text, has nothing to do with schools that are not engaging, do not lead to deep, rich understanding, relevant curriculum. The whole ad says what's wrong with schools today is we're letting these damn kids off too easy. Make it tougher, harder stuff means better stuff. That truly is the way of thinking that has led this whole movement, the raise the bar movement. Now, to my way of thinking, judging a teacher or a book or a test primarily on the basis of whether it is sufficiently difficult is like judging an opera on the basis of how many notes it contains that are really hard for the singers to hit. In other words, it misses most of what matters. I tend to like much better than what Clinton said, what a guy named John, you may have heard of him, John Dewey said about 100 years ago. The value of what students do resides in its connection with a stimulation of greater thoughtfulness, not in the greater strain it imposes. I put it to you that a lot of what's going on in states across the country now, as reflected by their standards documents and their tests, is more about strain even when it pretends to be about thoughtfulness. And this goes on in individual classrooms. Let me give you two quick examples. How many of you are now teaching elementary or secondary school or are administrators? How many of you are teachers or administrators now? How many of you are thinking seriously about becoming teachers? How many of you have come tonight not because you are students or educators, but are here primarily as parents? How many of you came for that reason? Thank you, although I recognize some others of you may be parents as well. Here's a phenomenon that can happen. Those of you who are already teachers know it can happen. Parent complains to the teacher, comes up and says, my child is bored in your classroom. You've heard this before. Now, that's often true. What interests me is not whether it's true, but why the parent thinks it's true. And a lot of times the parent will say, you know, you give these worksheets with 10 questions on them, and they're all so easy for my child, who was reading it for, <laughs> that she can blow through them without breaking a sweat. She's bored. And the teacher says, well, then, how about a worksheet with 25 questions on it, and they're really tricky. And the parent says, thank you, <laughs> instead of, are you making fun of me? And here's my take on it. If this kid is bored, it's probably because the teacher is using worksheets at all. Those dittos <laughs> where kids have to circle the vowel or solve for x in a bunch of unrelated questions or plug in facts that they look up that have no connection to anything anybody cares about. The more you know about teaching and learning, the less likely you are to run to the ditto machine to give students of any age what are known as worksheets. But as long as you're so focused on is it too easy or is it too hard, the more you miss the bigger picture and you end up with hard stuff that's boring. I'll give you another example. AP courses. A groan emerges from the room. <laughs> Advanced placement courses in high school are almost always among the hardest courses in high school. Yes. Are they among the very best courses in high school? I think it's at least an open question. In my experience, a lot of AP courses are just accelerated versions of the worst kind of teaching, where a textbook drives the curriculum, where the teacher spends too damn much time lecturing, where the kids in the course are thought of as being empty vessels into which knowledge is poured, but now it'll be more knowledge faster, because it's an AP course. And you say to me, no, you're being unfair. There are some really great AP teachers. You may be right. 
but no matter how good you are as an AP teacher, you can't be as good as you can be in an AP course because the point of the whole course is not to explore ideas in deep and creative ways. The point is to prepare you for a test so you get a three, four, or five on it. So for example, in an AP history course, the students might be really fascinated by the Civil War to the point that they want to spend a few months looking up primary sources, pretending they are in the Civil War, exploring whether slavery was the reason for real that the South was attacked by the North, asking whether the South should have been allowed to secede. In general, the kids want to spend a few months using this example to think like historians instead of just learning about history. Almost every thoughtful account of how to teach history says, yes, this is the way to do it. And what does your AP teacher say? Can't, we have to be at the Korean War by April. <laughs> if it is a test-oriented course, it is not as good a course as it could be. If it's a test-driven school, God help us. Now you may come back to me on the AP example and say, Cohn, you're missing the boat. A lot of AP courses are really good. And you, I'm open to persuasion. You could convince me. All I ask you is this. Don't assume it's a better course just because it's a harder course. And it's amazing how many people make exactly that assumption. And now in many states, high school exit exams are being introduced. Now, I have looked at some of the exams. In Maryland, we're not quite sure when it's going to kick in, how many tests, when they'll be counted for what. The one thing I know, that we do know, we don't know what's going to be on the test, but we know you're going to have to pass them or you don't get a diploma. Talk about cart before horse here. Now, I know something about the tests in New York and Massachusetts and in some of the other states, and I always ask people to think about this question. How many high school English teachers, really good high school English teachers, could pass the math part of the high school test? How many high school science teachers could pass the history part of the test? And how many state legislators could pass any of the test? <laughs> now, again, lest this sound like another cheap swipe at pop, pop uh, politicians, which it is a little bit. I, I would quickly add, I'm pretty sure that I could not pass the high school exit exam in Massachusetts, at least not without a, a lot of pointless cramming. And that leads to an interesting question, which was formulated by my friend and mentor, I think one of the most extraordinary educators in the United States, from whom I've learned an enormous amount, Deborah Meyer, M-E-I-E-R, who created the world-famous Central Park East schools in Harlem. And Meyer's mandate goes like this. No student should be expected to meet an academic requirement that a cross-section of successful adults in the community cannot. And I find it extraordinary that people haven't grappled with that challenge because it's very hard to imagine anyone saying, no, I disagree with that. We should take stuff that successful adults don't need, can't do, and say, you do it or you don't graduate from high school. How in the world can you possibly rationalize that? In fact, I would even add, modestly, Cohn's corollary to Meyer's mandate, which runs as follows. People who talk sanctimoniously about world-class standards for the 21st century, raising the bar to hold schools and students accountable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, should be required by law to take these tests themselves and have their scores published in the newspaper. <laughs> I'm not just saying these tests are often ridiculously difficult. I'm saying they're simply ridiculous because they don't capture what most of us on reflection would regard as an indication of what it means to be a well-educated person. 
there is one little last point to this objection, kind of a coda to it, that I feel obliged to add, even though it depresses the hell out of me. A while back, Debbie Meyer and I were sitting around uh, over dinner trying to make sense of what this standards movement is really about. And we came up with a deeply disturbing possibility. I will put it to you this way in the form of a hypothetical question. Please take this question seriously. Three years from now, when umpteen tests are being given to high school students in Maryland, you pass them or you don't graduate, almost every student in the state of Maryland passes the tests. What is the likely reaction from the state superintendent of instruction, the governor, the state legislature, the Baltimore Sun, and so on? What's that you say? Damn, these teachers are good? <laughs> Everywhere I go when I ask this question, I get the same answer or variation. People say, well, if that really happened, they all passed it, they would say, raise the bar, or the tests were obviously too easy, or the standards were too low. If you think that's true, that that would be the likely response by the state decision makers, please reflect on what that means. It means, as far as I can tell, that when people of this sort are talking about high standards, what they mean by definition is standards that all kids will never be able to meet. Because if all students did meet those standards, that would be taken as prima facie evidence that the standards were too low and had to be ratcheted up. That means, in turn, that despite all this nice talk about all kids can learn or leave no child behind, that the standards and accountability movement is invisibly predicated on making sure that some students must always be left behind, driven out of the schools, denied diplomas in order to show that we have tough standards. It means that the whole standards and testing enterprise, even if you happen to like elements of this state's test, is basically a giant sorting device. That means we are looking at one of the most profoundly anti-democratic phenomena in the history of American education. Of course, that conclusion depends on your answer to my hypothetical question. If you think the state policymakers would celebrate if all the kids passed the test, instead of saying raise the bar, I take that last part back. But if you think they say, obviously, it needs to be harder, it needs to be tougher, I cannot see another conclusion. Again, that last piece is separable from the rest. The larger point, my second concern with the whole tougher standards movement, is that it confuses better with what is merely harder. Here's my third concern. The tests themselves. Don't let anyone tell you that standardized tests are not accurate measures. They are, in fact, excruciatingly accurate measures of the size of the houses near the school where the test was given. You tell me how many kids in a given school district are on free or subsidized lunch. You tell me how many cars and what kind of cars are in the community. And I can predict with frightening accuracy what the test scores are going to be. The research quantifies that generalization and supports it. As much as 90% of the variation in test scores among schools, towns, or states can be accounted for without knowing a damn thing about what goes on inside the schools just by knowing socioeconomic variables. What that says to me is that it is unethical 
for a State Department of Education or a newspaper to publish a chart that ranks schools or towns by test scores as if they're telling us something primarily about the quality of teaching. And it is ignorance would be the most charitable explanation for either doing that or pointing to the chart as though it tells you this school is better than that school. But that's exactly what is going on. Never mind that it adds this, the arsenic of competition to the strychnine of standardized testing by setting educators against one another in a race to get the highest test score. I don't care if the test is even well designed. When you turn it into a race for the higher scores, you bring down the quality of schooling. There, the differences among the quality of tests are swamped by the way this becomes a way of publicly pressuring people to improve. But you know, if this was my only argument about standardized testing, that it's really just telling you about income, here's what you could respond. You could say, why don't we predict how well a school will do based on its socioeconomic status? And then if they do better than that, we can kiss them. And if they do worse than that, we can spank them. Or you could say, let's just look at your school, how it did in the year 1999 versus the year 2001 versus the year 2003. Same students. So if the scores go up or down, that tells us something. And that would be a persuasive response if it weren't for one tiny problem. The tests, again, I'm going to use a technical psychometric term here, the tests stink. Standardized tests tend to measure what matters least. Now, there are differences among the tests from one state to another. And we shouldn't assume they're all equally bad. Let me mention a few criteria by which you can determine, in part, how bad a testing system is. If the test involves a fair number of questions that are multiple choice, and I'm talking about what elementary school kids do, and I'm talking about what college students do. If it is a multiple choice test, even in part, you are not providing useful information about what students know and can do because the students cannot generate responses or even explain them. In fact, someone pointed out recently that a, a, a good multiple choice test is one deliberately designed so that students who know something will get it wrong anyway. Second, you know a testing system is bad news if the test is timed as in you have 45 minutes to do this, or 15 minutes, or two hours. Because now, what you are primarily measuring is not thoughtfulness, but speed. And really thoughtful students who need more time to formulate a response are going to look bad because the test is timed. Third, you know a testing system is in trouble if kids below the fourth grade are given standardized tests. I have yet to find a single reputable expert in the field of early childhood education who believes it is legitimate or even useful to give standardized tests to little kids. Some will say maybe the very end of third grade. Why? First, because little kids can't demonstrate what they know very well, usually, on a, in a standardized format. You talk to them afterwards, and it's clear they understood what they got wrong. And two, because little kids are changing at rapid and divergent rates, not at the same pace. So the notion that all little kids have to be at the same place is simply counter to the best research and practice we have in development. Next, you know a testing system is bad if kids are tested every blessed year. If that is happening, even if it's not the same test every year, at that point, the curriculum has largely been cannibalized by the tests. 
In addition to that, we are assuming that at each year, all kids must move in lockstep. By the time you're nine, you're supposed to know this. What that does is create failures where none need exist. Note that George Bush's plan demands, never mind federal mandates for all states. Some states are being very destructive on their own, thanks very much, but some are not. And the president, we must have testing every year. At this point, it is the test designers and the politicians who are largely creating the curriculum. That's not just insulting to teachers and future teachers. It's terrible for kids. You know that a, a testing program is really bad if regardless of the format of the questions, multiple choice versus free response and so on, it is in large part simply tapping knowledge that kids have committed to short-term memory. So they have to spit out a bunch of facts. Or even if they're good at playing with ideas, if they didn't happen to be good at cramming them into short-term memory, they're not going to be able to play with them, and so they're going to have a bad score. The worst kind of test of all, though, are tests like the CPBS. The Comprehensive Test of Basic Skills and other tests, the ITBS, Iowa test, the California, Stanford, and Metropolitan Achievement Tests, CAT, SAT, MAT, which is the way first grade reading teaching comes to look with some of these tests. These are called norm referenced tests. If you already know what that means and, and why it's significant, I won't waste more than a minute or two of your time. If you don't know what it means, I think a minute or two is all it will take for you to understand how wretched and pointless these instruments are, to use perfectly objective and neutral language to introduce this point. <laughs> norm reference tests are generally reported out in percentile terms, though not always in the case of the SAT-9. And the results always come out the same way. Regardless of how smart the kids are, regardless of how good the teachers are, regardless of which questions are on the test, exactly 10% of the kids taking the test will end up in the top 10%. <laughs> and less humorously, exactly half the kids taking the test, or half the schools, will fall below the median and look like failures. Not because necessarily they are failures, but because that's what median means. When you know that you're in the top X percent, you know nothing of value. Maybe you still don't have a clue. It's just that other people have slightly less of a clue. <laughs> the animating question that drives tests like the CTBS is not are our students learning what they should? Are schools doing a good job? No. The animating question is, who's beating whom? It's not about excellence. It's about victory, which is completely different. It gets better, or should I say worse, when you know how the tests are put together. When they come up with a pilot edition of the CTBS, or a test like that, a trial version, and they put a question on it, let's say question number 17, and they give it to a bunch of kids. And almost all the kids get that question right. What do they do? Do they celebrate? They throw the question off the test and replace it with one that only about half the kids are going to get right. Whether kids should know this stuff is irrelevant in the CTBS. Whether it's a bunch of crap or stuff that's really important plays virtually no role in the design of the test. What the test manufacturers want is high response variance, which means in ordinary language, a nice range of scores to separate kids out so we can see who's beating whom. Now this becomes even more disturbing when you think about the implications. For example, let's say you were going to create a test like this like the CTBS, 
and you wanted a nice range so you could see who's beating whom. You could rank and sort, which is the point of these tests, not assess excellence, rank and sort. If you put questions on the test that too many kids are taught in school, too many of them will get the answer right, and that'll blow the whole point. So the questions that correspond to the content that teachers think is important to teach tend to be dropped off a lot and replaced by trivia or, if you're really clever about it, by questions that tap knowledge not taught in school. Which kids are likely to have acquired that knowledge? Kids who went to quality preschools. Kids who have computers at home. Kids who are taken on interesting trips. Kids who overhear thoughtful conversations at the dinner table. In short, bias in favor of the affluent is built into these tests, apart from the fact that they were never designed to measure the quality of schooling. Probably one of the country's leading experts in the field of educational measurement, Jim Popham, emeritus at UCLA, said recently, to use a test like the CTBS to measure students or schools is like using a tablespoon to measure temperature. It was never designed for this purpose, and yet second graders, fourth graders, and sixth graders in Maryland are subjected to these punitive, pointless, competitive tests whose very design makes it educational malpractice to point to the results as though you learned something meaningful. Say what you will about the MISPAP, at least it's not norm referenced, which is why for some educational activists, step one is getting rid of these tests. It's bad enough that in some states, individual school districts give these norm reference tests in addition to the state, but Maryland requires it. It is inexcusable. And the more you know about these tests and how they're designed, the more you would say, when I am a teacher, I cannot in good conscience participate in this process, and I will spend my energies not merely teaching in the best way I know how, but struggling together to get rid of these tests and replace them when necessary with reasonable measures. Now, of course, my first point suggests that you can overdo any kind of assessment. It's just that some are really bad. Now, there are some things about the MISPAP, the Maryland test, that frankly impress me. I don't know a single other state that has kids evaluated on group projects, which in effect taps the ability to think with other people. In most areas of American education, that's called cheating. <laughs> Even though in real life, or the part of real life that follows schools, you're not expected to do most stuff on your own. You, you name the field, and in real life, what is realistic is looking at people's ability to work with others, exchange ideas and talents and resources, and I, my hat is off to any any state that says we're going to look at kids' ability to do that. Not all of the test is simply coughing up facts. You've got to be able to do some kind of writing. You've got to be able to do some application with real world tasks. In this respect, Maryland is well ahead of a number of other states. But the test is timed. In fact, quick writes almost mandates the ability to do stuff with speed more than anything else. And the test has become, in Maryland, as it has because lesser tests have become in other places, a pressure-filled ordeal that has corrupted much of the teaching that could be happening. Several researchers looked a few years ago at the MISPAP tests, surveying teachers. They found that about 40% of the fifth grade teachers, quote, strongly agreed that MISPAP includes developmentally inappropriate tasks. When you're talking about an eight-year-old, 
you know, doing three hours of concentrated stuff over a period of five days, you already have something that's developmentally inappropriate. Here's what the researchers concluded about Maryland. The results reported here suggest that the program has met one of its goals in increasing the amount of writing students do in school. At the same time, teachers' responses suggest the possibility that this change may have negative ramifications as well in terms of both instructional impact and test validity. Many teachers maintain that the emphasis on writing is excessive and that instruction has suffered because of the amount of time required for it. More than that, however, is the kind of writing that exists, never mind the fact that it is timed. What is the result when we have a system like this that places a lot of emphasis on how well people do on a standardized test, even one that may be better than, say, Virginia's, which isn't saying much. What you end up having is a situation where you are measuring the skill of taking tests. Trust me, I have never met a teacher who could not instantly name several kids in her class or his class who's really talented but just don't score well on tests. Some of you may be like that as well. And that's as true of the MISPAP as it is of the Virginia SOL test, as it is of the Ohio proficiency, the FCAT, the MCAS, the ASAP, pick your state and its associated acronym. All of those kids are underestimated as a result of standardized tests. But there are also some kids who are really good at memorizing stupid acronyms for the things you have to keep in mind when you write an essay. For the kids who can cough up the right kind of thing that the scorers will like, who on math tests can remember the algorithms and the tricks and techniques and get the right answer even though they don't know what the hell is going on. How do you divide one fraction by another fraction? You remember? Invert and multiply. Why? I don't know either. I don't know either. When I was a kid, my test scores, at least in math, were super. And my understanding was superficial. I look better than I deserve to. So the test underestimates and overestimates at the same time. Now, let me tell you what the research says. Now, this research has not been done specifically with the MISPAP. It may be less appropriate, but it was done, among other tests, with the CTBS. And you might be interested to hear, at the high school level, with the SAT. Here's what they did. One, test in ele one, one study in elementary school, one study in middle school, one study in high school. They classified the students as being either deep thinkers or relatively shallow and superficial thinkers, depending on how they approached something they were given to read. What was their habit? The superficial or shallow students tended to do as little as they could get away with, guess wildly, and try to just cram stuff in that they, think they thought they would need for a test. The deep thinkers were the kids who reread stuff they, on their own, they were having trouble with, asked questions of themselves while they read, and tried actively, even unbidden, to connect what they were doing now with something that happened last week. You get the idea? Here's what they found. Higher standardized test scores tend to be correlated with the shallow style of thinking and learning. Note, I'm not saying there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. If you say to me, hey, aren't some students good deep thinkers and good test takers? Yes, I'm sure there are many of them here in this room. Aren't there some students who are neither? Yes. But there is a statistically significant positive relationship that suggests that in general, as the scores go up, the depth of thinking often goes down. That corroborates the everyday thing we've noticed about some kids who do better than they should and some kids who do worse than they should on these tests. But here's where the real damage comes in from standardized tests. I like to say to parents, 
If some local official brags about how high the test scores are, you should respond by asking, what did you have to sacrifice to get higher test scores? Because if every question being asked, if every subject or program or policy in a school has to pass the MISPAP test, namely, is this going to raise our MISPAP scores? If not, sorry, no room. You have decimated. You have decimated the schools. And even though MISPAP is better than some other state tests, no test can cover everything that matters. So when you focus on the test, you will always be excluding some stuff. Let me tell you what is being excluded in a lot of schools in this state and across the country. Although you can see it, if you want to see hell come to light, educationally speaking, go to Texas. <laughs> which is an educational nightmare. And I could talk for an hour about why that's true. That anybody would actually run on that record as opposed to running away from that record is extraordinary in its own right. But what's being given up? See if any of this rings true for those of you familiar with the current state of schools in Maryland. And if it's less true here than it is in Massachusetts or Colorado or Minnesota, good. But if any of this is true here, watch out. What's being given up? Recess. Little kids given less of a chance to run around to have a chance to play. What's being given up? The chance to read books and other materials that kids choose in the early grades if somebody thinks that it's not the right source to prepare them for the reading and writing exercises on the standardized test. What's being given up? Electives in high school, music, and some of the arts. Class meetings where kids together with their teachers sit down to share experiences, solve problems, make decisions, and in the process learn and practice social skills and democratic dispositions. Or how about current events? Whatever you think about this last presidential election followed by the C-lection, I'll tell you this. It was what a teacher might call the mother of all teachable moments. You know what a teachable moment is? An opportunity that sometimes comes serendipitously that provides a wonderful opportunity to learn if you're able and willing to take advantage of it. What an opportunity. Wow, day, every day the newspaper had something else that provided an opportunity for kids with their teacher to learn about history, politics, math, and even psychology. And you know what I'm hearing from teachers around the country? We didn't have time, because current events weren't going to be on the standardized test. What a missed opportunity. And the more emphasis there is on how well you do on a test, any test, the more things end up being sacrificed with scripting lessons and even trying to psych out a written test by preparing kids to do particular things with it. Here's what someone wrote me on my website from Maryland. We don't have time to do all those long, extended, inquiry-based tasks. But if you're smart, you know that kids need to be able to read and write well quickly, under pressure, and on demand, even if they don't understand something. Students are fed terms and concepts from fields like vocabulary with the hope they'll pop them up or make the connection on the test day. Here's what a, a Maryland fifth grade teacher told a Washington Post reporter. We used to take kids out once or twice a week for a break to play kickball or just play. We don't have time to do that anymore. I miss that. At school, the reporter continues, a focus on the rigor required by Ms. Papp means less creative writing and more structured writing. You get the idea. These criticisms, most of them, do not just apply to other states, even though there are aspects. 
And frankly, I got to tell you, I have read some criticisms of the MISPAP from parents in Maryland that make me want to rush to the test's defense. Because there are some parents who object to what I like about them. The fact that there is some problem solving and understanding and writing involved. And there are some parents who want to turn back the clock and have more tests like the even worse CTBS that's just about memorizing mindlessly skills and facts and words and numbers that are coughed up on demand, sometimes in a norm reference test. So some people are criticizing it from that direction. But just because there are people whose motives and values you are skeptical of, criticizing something doesn't necessarily make the something good. Because there may be something about it that is problematic in its own right. All over the country, I find examples of how even where the tests are supposed to be relatively good, you end up with a problem. Never mind that the validity of the test is compromised when people are able to teach to it, because you're no longer sampling real learning. You're sampling the extent to which kids have been prepared for this. One more. Where are we? The tougher standards people misunderstand motivation by assuming achievement and results are all that matter, never mind what it does to interest in learning. They misunderstand improvement by thinking if it's more difficult, that must be an improvement. And they often use evaluations like standardized tests. So when people talk about higher expectations, higher standards, excellence, rigor, challenge, often what they mean in practice is nothing more than higher scores on standardized tests, which are multiply flawed. Here's the last one I want to mention tonight. The standard Eastos get school reform wrong by simply assuming that people with more power can and should compel those with less power to do their bidding. Even if you disagree with me about the MISPAP or the standards behind it and think these are actually pretty good, you don't buy my criticism. Folks, you don't make change by saying, I know better than you, so I, sitting in Baltimore or Annapolis, am going to compel you to do what I know is best. It doesn't work when people try to micromanage how teachers are prepared in universities like this. It doesn't work when managers in corporations try to compel employees to jump through specific hoops. It doesn't work with teachers and kids. The older I get, I swear to you, the more I think you can judge someone's character on the basis of whether they're able to resist the temptation to say to those with less power, I know better, you must do it my way. Because human beings are pesky creatures who resist this. I have a friend in Wisconsin who likes to say, people don't resist change. People resist being changed. I say, but what the whole standards and accountability movement is about was captured best by a sign that I saw on a classroom wall once. And it read, the beatings will continue until morale improves. The good news is that teacher intended it ironically. The bad news is your state public officials aren't smiling. When you single out schools with bribes or threats based on their performance on tests, when you publicize test scores and then rank them by test scores to create a kind of public shaming, when you give money to teachers, schools, or districts, not on the basis of who needs, but on the basis of who's jumping through the hoops, you have a seriously screwed up system. Some teachers weren't doing much writing with their students. Some still aren't. 
some teachers in classrooms were doing worksheets and textbooks and lectures and Friday spelling quizzes, and they were staying one chapter ahead of the kids, and they were reading off, and I found this when I went to college, reading their lecture notes off yellow legal paper that wasn't yellow when the notes were written. <laughs> There's some lousy stuff that goes on in American classrooms. But folks, if I am in the State Department of Education, or if I am a principal and I see this, I have to simplify two choices, a demand model and a support model. The support model says, how can I support you to become as good a teacher as you can be? How can I give you help? How can I work with you to invite you to make your teaching and learning more exciting for you and your kids? And the other choice is a demand model where instead of working with you, I do things to you and I say, you're going to have to have more writing because it's on the test by which you're judged. That's not just disrespectful. That's counterproductive from everything we know in human psychology and from history of political regimes. Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. Because democracy is time consuming. Working with teachers doesn't produce guaranteed results. But doing too not only fails to produce real results in the long run, you know what it does? It drives people out. Sometimes people come up to me and say, you know, you know who you should be talking to? It's the state legislature. And I respond that I have gradually learned that it generally works out better if I speak where I've been invited. But now and then, someone screws up and invites me to speak to a really important group. A year and a half ago, I spoke to the National Association of State Boards of Education. I don't know how. Somebody got my name off Rent-A-Gadfly or something, but <laughs> I assure you that person is now scanning the want ads. But here's what I said. I said, you may disagree with 90% of what I've said. That's cool, but you know what? What you think about these issues, as powerful as you are, is not ultimately what matters. Neither is what I think. What ultimately matters is what teachers and prospective teachers think about this stuff. Because if college students who are interested in becoming teachers take a look at what has become of American schools and say, Screw this. I can make more money elsewhere. I'm not doing this for the money. If you're going to bribe me and threaten me, if you're going to manipulate me and treat me like a pet to get me to fall in line with, or to use the Orwellian word, align my curriculum with what somebody in the state capital demands so that I'm a technician and not a professional educator, I will not go into this field. And if I am currently a teacher and you're treating me like this, and it's all about how well they do on the MISPAP, not about real learning and a chance to bring students in on the process, then I'm going to take early retirement, or I'm going to go through the motions. And I get notes on my website, and I read newspaper articles from around the country that this is now happening at a time when teachers are desperately needed, that teachers are, in fact, bailing out not because they don't think they're paid well enough, but because of the accountability movement. Because accountability has come to be a code word for more control over what happens in classrooms by people who are not in classrooms. And it has approximately the same effect on learning that a noose has on breathing. Remember an hour and a half ago that study? That suggests that this isn't just some flaky thing I thought up this morning. The data suggests that, in fact, people become more controlling, and they become more resentful, and it doesn't work as well. And I told these state board members from around the country that teachers and principals who are bailing out, or the teachers who at least are saying, I'm not teaching third or fifth grade, that's for sure. 
are not, as a rule, the mediocre performers who are afraid of being held accountable. They are among the most talented educators who are, because they're the ones who can't do the most exciting stuff if it doesn't produce higher test scores. What does that mean in very practical bottom line terms? It means that this top-down, heavy-handed move to raise standards is lowering standards. And that's true for many reasons, but driving some of the best and the brightest out of the profession is just one of them. And by the way, I have to add again, where is that most likely to happen? Places like Baltimore City Schools. Places with more low-income African-American and Latino students, places that traditionally have low test scores are where there is the most pressure to raise test scores and the most punishment and shame for teachers who don't, which is where the best ones are especially likely to leave. Never mind the inexcusable plan in Maryland already coming true in other states of having a high school test or series of tests that say regardless of your performance over 12 years, you don't pass these tests, you don't get a diploma. Never mind that that violates accepted practices in the field of education. It's outrageous. And that is going to have an effect if it is allowed to happen here and elsewhere of not only increasing the dropout rate, which is already starting to happen, especially in places that have been doing this for a while, like Texas. It is going to disproportionately increase the dropout rate among poor and minority students, which is already starting to happen. If high stakes tests, you pass this or you don't get a diploma, are allowed to be implemented in Maryland, you are going to see what I can only describe as an educational ethnic cleansing in this state. And that is outrageous and unethical. And it is why, to come finally to my last point, finally, people are rebelling all over the country. Parents, students, and educators are coming to realize how grotesque this standards and accountability movement really is. In my experience, and there may be exceptions, if you want to know how people feel about standardized tests, look at how close they are to real students in classrooms. Because the teachers who work with the kids every day know best how destructive it is to have a NISPAP, let alone a CTBS-oriented curriculum. The principals often are see it as problematic, but in general, maybe a little less so. The superintendents and other people in the central office think, well, this is something we have to do to align our curriculum. And by the time you get to people who visit classrooms occasionally as photo ops, they think it's a damn good idea to have plenty of testing and accountability to raise standards in American schools. The closer you are to seeing the cost, never mind third and fifth grade students who are throwing up in terror that they're not going to score well enough for their school, or sobbing. Never mind the inhumane effects of a test-based curriculum on children. The effect on the curriculum and on American education's future is so appalling that people are taking short-term steps to minimize the damage and long-term steps to eliminate the source of the problem. An example of a short-term step is for teachers to say, we're going to do what we have to to prepare kids for Maryland's test, and then we're going to get back to the real learning. And they never lose sight of that distinction. In the short term, administrators refuse to brag about high test scores, because if they do, they're part of the problem. In fact, the people who come from districts that have high test scores, and by an amazing coincidence, are affluent, have a special opportunity to criticize this stuff because no one can say, well, you don't like it because your scores are lousy. They can reply, our scores happen to be pretty good, but we're not proud of that. Let me show you what we are proud of. And that's the stuff put at risk by tests. And the other short-term response that I always try to remind people of is be a buffer. Be a cushion. Wherever you are or wherever you will be five years from now, 
on the food chain of American education. Do what you can to protect those below you from the pressure imposed above. If you are an administrator getting pressure from the State Department of Education or the state legislature or your school board to raise test scores, and you know that would undermine the quality of teaching and learning, you do what you can to absorb that pressure and not pass it on to your principals. And if you're a principal getting pressure from the central office, your job is to protect teachers, not have staff meetings to talk about raising test scores. Because if you're doing that, you are allowing your authority to be usurped by people who may, not, who may know less about teaching and learning than you do. And if you're a teacher and you're getting pressure from your principal, or you get it a few years from now when you are a teacher, folks, you are the last line of defense Without getting fired, your job is to protect kids from a test-oriented curriculum, from a top-down, heavy-handed, corporate-style approach to school reform, not to do their dirty work for them. But that's all short-term. Protecting them won't change the system. They'll still be a Ms. Papp or a CTBS that our children's children will have to take unless we fight this stuff. Two quick stories for you of people who did that. Wisconsin. Wisconsin's governor two years ago, Tommy Thompson, who is now the US Secretary of Health and Human Services, said, we're going to have an exit exam. Kids pass the test or they don't get a diploma. And ordinary parents across the state of Wisconsin said, you have got to be kidding. Not with my child, you don't. And they got on the phone to their state legislators and said, you vote for that high school exit exam, you will be out of, an, out of office. And they won. They won. They succeeded in turning back in Wisconsin what ordinary citizens can, if they put their minds to it, turn back in Maryland. I'll tell you a more extraordinary story in Japan. How many standardized tests are there in Japan? Zero. They have a hell of a university admission test that I wouldn't wish on anyone. But they do not have a MISPAP. They do not have a standardized test at all for elementary school aged kids. Most nations in the world do not, by the way. US students are tested to an extent that is unprecedented in our history and unparalleled anywhere in the world, just to put in a little perspective there. But a few years ago, the government of Japan proposed a system of statewide or countrywide testing. And you know what happened? Classroom teachers got together and said, we cannot in good conscience allow this to happen. Not only will we not teach to such a test, we won't break the shrink wrap and give it out to the kids. Japanese folks, for what such generalizations are worth, do not have a reputation for being troublemakers. And yet here they saw the stakes were high enough that they risked their careers to say, we will not administer these tests. And they won. And more than one observer of Japanese education has credited their strong points to precisely the absence of standardized tests in Japan. There are individual teachers in the United States. I know one in Massachusetts, one in Colorado, who put their jobs on the line and refused to give out the tests. They boycotted it. There are high school students in Massachusetts and Illinois, hundreds of them, who organized a statewide boycott of, that, of their respective state's tests. And increasingly, parents are coming to realize that they ought to be writing letters to the editor and showing up at school board meetings, but that's not good enough. There's more stuff they ought to be doing, including refusing to allow their children to take the tests. Until when this becomes widespread enough, people at the top, at the top will say, what if we gave a test and nobody came? There are many other specific suggestions for what can be done that are less radical than civil disobedience. They are on my website, alfiecone.org. They're in a book I wrote on standardized testing. They are on other websites as well. And I'm out of time, even if I felt the need to tell you. But I will conclude 
asking you please not to rush off unless you have to because I want to take five, at least five minutes worth of questions. I apologize for going on as long as I have about this stuff. And I appreciate your patience, but let me close by telling you something I've learned from the civil rights movement in this country. And we are facing an educational emergency in this country in the name of accountability and standards that lead me to think that analogy is appropriate. What we've learned from the civil rights movement and other nonviolent resistance in other parts of the world is that bad laws and policies continue to exist only with our cooperation and consent. If we get together and withhold that cooperation and consent, those policies and laws don't stand a chance. I believe that action, extreme as it may sound, is called for because of the extent of the harm being done to real flesh and blood children in Maryland. You do what you can, you do what your conscience dictates, if you decide to become a teacher and you're not already one, I wish you nothing but luck and good fortune in creating environments that are not about test preparation, but about real learning. Thanks. Thanks. If you have to leave, please do so quietly. But for just a few moments, I want to be able to take some responses and questions here. And then I'm going to go out to where the books are if you want to talk some more. Who would like to say something or ask something? Yes, please. Stand up if you, if you would, just so people can hear. The question is about grades, not so much test scores, and how parents have resisted attempts to get rid of traditional grading. In many cases, if people who are, have kids in school and have never been invited to think about these issues before are suddenly told, we're getting rid of the report cards with which you are familiar and that you had in your own childhood, and we're going to have some new fancy assessment system, I don't blame them for being nervous. In many cases, the grades their kids get are the only real window they have into what is going on in school. What educators have to do, their responsibility, is to help parents understand that that is a foggy window and that there are better, more meaningful, and informative ways to know both what their kids are doing and how well their kids are doing, and to give them choices about it because even good ideas cannot be shoved down people's throats. In some places, I know what they've done is they have had a transitional period where parents can choose. Either their kids collect assignments throughout the year in portfolios, selectively choosing examples of what they've learned. And then the kids not only attend the parent-teacher conference, they run the parent-teacher conference by taking the parents step by step through the portfolio of what I've done, and here's where I was in October, and here's where I hope to be in March, and here's where I am in January. And the parents get a richer, better sense of what's going on in school. Or the parents are told, you cannot have that, and you can have a grade. You pick. Even the most incorrigible old school parents who want the grades get a whiff of what's going on across the room in those parent-teacher student-directed conferences, and they say, hey, I want some of that. And when the parents have concerns about this, but will I still get to understand my child's need for improvement? There are good answers. And if the parents say, but I want my kid to go to college, will no grades prevent my kid from getting into college? There has to be a strong answer to that. First of all, 
colleges could care less about anything your kid does below ninth grade. So there's not even a whisper of an excuse for grades below high school. But second, there are high schools in this country that give no grades at all, and the kids get into both large universities and selective private colleges. This is normally done in a way that's working with instead of doing to. And there you maximize the chance that parents will be brought in on the process instead of having somebody cram a good idea down their throats. What else? Yes? What's a substitute for a timed test like a praxis test for being a teacher? First, I wouldn't have the... How many of you who are familiar with the test would say, and I, I am not fishing for an answer here that you think I want. I want an honest response. Show me by applause. How many of you who are in this university as instructors or students think that the praxis test is pretty good and a good indication of the stuff you should know and be able to do to be a good teacher. That is extraordinary. How many of you think the test is seriously defective, not just too difficult or too easy, but not a good representative of what teachers should know and be able to do? If I was a state decision maker, only extraordinary arrogance could lead me to ignore that response unless there was some reason to think that Salisbury State was, was unusual. I would never begin such a test unless I had good reasons to believe the test was not only valid and reliable in the narrow statistical sense, but that it was also a good predictor of what the best teachers do in classrooms when they are teaching. Now, one question is, do we need such an exam to decide at all? who's going to get into the classroom, or are there other ways to make sure that we have the teachers who are most excited about teaching and are competent at doing so? But second, if I was going to decide that there had to be some kind of assessment, I would steer away from anything that was timed for the same reasons I mentioned with student exams, and steer away from most pencil and paper measures, which tend not to tell you much about who are going to be the very best teachers. I would use the kinds of assessments that are used in most fields. You know, I mean, if somebody wants to know whether you're going to be a good lifeguard or refrigerator repair person or psychotherapist or, you know, a journalist and so on, typically they have you do this stuff and they watch you doing it. Or they have some sort of exhibition where you can demonstrate what it is you know and can do, and they check in with you periodically once you've started your career and watch you actually doing it. They don't give you a pencil and paper test. And there are ways to do this that are more or less authentic, more or less useful as predictors. But sometimes people in the testing field get so caught up with the minutia of what is considered in technical terms a good test that they miss the bigger picture of whether this kind of test makes sense and whether it might be weeding out some of our best teachers. Let me make sure we get some other folks, and then we can talk more later. Yeah? First, I would make sure that your premise is true and doesn't reflect a prejudice about low-income versus high-income parents' accessibility. Second, if it is true that low-income parents do not get as involved in what's going on, I would want to know why that's true. Are some parents overwhelmed and intimidated by systems and people in schools who don't welcome them, so they feel as though I'm not smart enough to take part in all of this and that's the way I've been made to feel my whole life. Is it a simple matter of not having time because I'm pulling down a modest income on two jobs and I'm exhausted and don't have the ability? Or there's a language barrier 
And if it is one of those reasons, then the question becomes, what can we as the school do to make those parents feel welcome, meet them on their own terms, and so on, so they can participate? Just because some parents, low or high income, black or white, rural, urban, or suburban, will never participate in those back-to-school nights, no matter what happens in them, is not a reason to give grades, given what the research says is the harm of giving traditional grades. You can still do portfolios for kids because you are collecting information from the kids in a more authentic way than tests, and you are reporting it back to the kids, even if not to the parents. Finally, I would say, if I have trouble with parent involvement, and I'm the kind of parent who, for whatever reason, doesn't make the time to participate in a lot of these activities, am I more or less likely to come to a school event if my kid's going to be there talking to me about what I figured out and why I'm excited and to ask me questions and invite my questions about what's going on? Nice refreshments help, but nothing is as powerful as having your own kid play an active role, which is the opposite of traditional grades, among their many other faults, is that kids are about as passive and done to in such a system as was ever the case. Now, in terms of bringing parents of all kinds of backgrounds in on improving schools, I think we can do no better than what some friends of mine in Chicago have done. They did this with a largely poor African-American population in the city of Chicago, but I can't imagine a group, a demographic group of parents where this would not work. Here's what they do. They get the parents to show up, and they ask them, what do you want your kids to get out of this school? And the parents often will cough up the usual reactionary media cliches, basic skills, higher standards, and so on. Then they say, let's talk about when you were in school. Can you remember that far back? Tell me about when you learned to read. What was it like? What was happening in the class? How did it make you feel? Pick a time when you felt about this tall because of what was going on. Now pick a time, try to remember one instance when you were a little kid, when you loved school and you could really get something out of it and you were sorry to see the period or the day come to an end. What was happening there? People think about it, they write some notes, they talk to a partner, they report out, the facilitator writes down the answers on the blackboard or a flip chart. And everywhere you go, people give the same answers. You know, it didn't happen very much, because frankly, a lot of school sucked. And I felt terrible about it. In high school, at least I could hang out with my friends. But please, I couldn't wait for the bell to ring. I, couldn't, I was counting the days to the weekend or the weeks to vacation. At some point, I even decided school may not be for me, unless I need it for a job. But there was this one teacher, this one time, who dot, 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 and what do they say? Who let us learn together instead of at separate desks. Who let us decide what project we were going to do instead of telling us. Interestingly, some kindergarten